Okay, everyone, as you are joining us, we are going to wait for uh, just a few moments so that we can welcome everyone into the webinar. I'm Bonnie McDonald. I'm the president and CEO of Landmarks Illinois. So just hang tight. We're going to start our presentation in just a moment. And we are live and recording. This webinar is going to be posted later to our YouTube page at Landmarks Illinois. And for those of you who may want to use our closed captioning, we do have real-time closed captioning available to you. Uh, so you just go to the bottom of your screen and click on the CC closed captions button. And of course, on, on YouTube, you can translate that into other languages as well. And everyone, there will be a Q&A at the end of our program. If you have some questions for Joe Antunovich, our presenter today, just make sure that you uh, post them into the Q&A and I will facilitate that and give him your questions at the end of the presentation. So with that, we're at uh, 12.01. So I believe we are ready to begin, everyone. So an official warm welcome from Landmarks Illinois. I'm Bonnie McDonald, the president and CEO, and we're delighted to have you here for this very celebratory and important conversation today. Uh, this lecture series, the Snapshots Lecture Series, features guest presenters who do uh, one-hour deep dives into topics about preservation projects and other, you know, other informa information that's helpful to our preservation community across the state. And today's lecture is on the 20th anniversary of the saving of the Edith Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois. Now, in August of 2021, a distinguished group of architects, designers, and journalists came together to inform the New York Times about what they felt were the top 25 designs of post-war um, architecture in the entire world. And number two on that list was the Edith Farnsworth House designed by Mies van der Rohe for his client, Dr. Edith Farnsworth, um, which you are going to hear about today. <clears throat> Not only one of the most influential residences in history, beyond its design as well, the, the Edith Farnsworth House preservation effort in 2003 was groundbreaking in its own right. And we're so proud to have a conversation today all about that firsthand from somebody who made that possible. And that's our guest presenter, Joe Antunovich, who is a Landmarks Illinois board member, current board member. At the time, he was the chairman of our board of directors, and he is also a renowned architect in his own right with Antunovich Associates. And we know there are many stories that he could tell today. We're just going to get a fraction of those, but we want you to learn about the, Farnsworth, the Edith Farnsworth House and how it came to be saved in 2003. But in a moment, we're going to hear that from him. I also want to extend a very warm welcome for you who may be joining us for the very first time to our Snapshots lectures. Uh, we hope that you have a, a wonderful time today and you'll keep coming back to learn more about our preservation community. And if you haven't met us at Landmarks Illinois before, uh, we are the statewide historic preservation nonprofit organization. We do advocacy, education, and have resources um, that we provide to people all across the state. Um, we've been in business since 1971, and we provide our services for free as well. You can find more on our website at landmarks.org. And just to let you know, at any one time, our advocacy team is working on about 150 to 200 advocacy projects, helping people save places that matter to them in their communities, like the Farnsworth House. That was one of many that we have worked on. Um, as a whole, we've helped people save over 24,000 historic places that are important to their communities over the, the time that we have been an organization. So we're so glad that you've joined us today to learn more about what we do um, and what we have to offer to help people save places for people. We also are going to be uploading this to our YouTube channel where you can see not only this particular uh, webinar, but all those in the past. We have many that you can see about the Underground Railroad, about New Philadelphia. Um, so I hope that you'll go back and learn more about our presenters and those topics. We also, uh, before starting our program, we do want to thank our dedicated sponsors and uh, supporters, members, 
every one of you makes this work possible uh, to, to help people save places, but also to present this information to you. Um, our impact around the state is possible because of your support. And that includes our generous preservation snapshot sponsors, which you see on the slide today, CNH Specialty Craftworks, Jack Corp, which is an architecture firm, and also architects Vinci Hamp. Uh, Vinci Hamp Architects. So their support has made this lecture possible and to keep it very low cost for those of you here today. Um, so we're glad to share this with you because of them. We also have annual corporate sponsors, which uh, are generous supporters to make our advocacy program possible. You'll see them here. If you would like to join us as an annual corporate sponsor and be recognized like this in everything that we do, please contact me, Bonnie McDonald, I'm the president. You can find my information on our website at landmarks.org, or I'll put it in the chat as well so that you can see it later. Um, we're pleased to welcome preservation's most experienced companies uh, who join us in helping to make preservation possible. Now, to become a member as well, we have a robust membership program that has benefits like our wonderful newsletter that we provide the Arch. We have information on our website and you can be a part of our community by becoming a member. Uh, membership support is essential to our success and to providing those free resources to anybody who needs them across the state. So if you're not currently a member, please check out our website, landmarks.org, where you have plentiful options to become a part of our community to become a supporter. And also just one more reminder that we care deeply about making our programs accessible in all ways that we possibly can. So if you need closed captioning today, we have real-time closed captions available. Just go to the bottom of the screen and click on the CC closed captioning button. Uh, this presentation is being recorded, and as I mentioned, it'll be uploaded to the YouTube page. So if you miss something, you can go back and listen to it again. And you'll want to see this presentation once more because you'll see the photos that uh, Joe Antunovich has put together and his team are remarkable. And I know you're going to enjoy this. Uh, so on to today's presentation. The Edith Farnsworth House is one of the most significant residential designs of the 20th century. As I mentioned, it was recognized as one of the most important designs around the world. The home was almost lost, and in late 2003, it was saved through a joint effort by Landmarks Illinois, uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and the Friends of the Farnsworth House. I would like to recognize uh, that this program and the celebrations that are happening throughout the year are possible because of the leadership of the National Trust for Historic Preservation um, in partnership with Landmarks Illinois. I wanna thank Scott Mahaffey, the executive director of the Edith Farnsworth House, a National Trust Historic Site for their support partnership and really leading the charge to make sure this big celebration is, um, is uh, honored uh, for the groundbreaking preservation. The story would also not be complete without David Ballman, as many of you on, I'm sure on this webinar knew David or knew of him, and he was really a remarkable person, preservationist, and made this effort possible. Um, it is with heartfelt remembrance that we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the preservation of the Edith Farnsworth House, um, really in honor of David. Uh, he was instrumental in mobilizing preservation support, you know, here in Illinois, as well as nationally, there's, you know, across the world, as the looming sale came forward uh, when Lord Palumbo put this up for auction. Now, we are very sad to note uh, David's passing. Uh, sadly, he passed in uh, November of last year, and we were we were not able to um, capture that story, though you can see he was one of our uh, Landmarks Illinois influencers for our 2021 50th anniversary celebration, and you can see him on camera talking about the Edith Farnsworth House if you go to our YouTube page again. Uh, effort to save the home also included passionate preservationists like Joe Antunovich, our former chair who I mentioned, who teamed up with David and many others that you see in this photo to ensure that the, the Edith Farnsworth House stayed here in Illinois. And I really encourage all the guests here to, to listen to his wonderful stories today. You know, it alivens that place. And of course, you can go out today and see the Edith Farnsworth House here in Illinois because of their efforts. So um, big uh, happy birthday as well. Uh, Joe Antunovich is joining us today on his birthday. So this is an even more special treat that he's spending this time with us. So Joe, I'm happy to introduce you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. And we can't wait to hear from you. Thank you, Pani. Uh, 
little overwhelmed with all of that. That's good. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Joe Antunovich. I'm an architect here in Chicago. Welcome to our offices. Uh, behind me is where we sit and have sat for over uh, 33 years. And just thrilled that we're here in Chicago. I'm honored to share with you my experiences with the Edith Farnsworth House. I came to Chicago in 1974 to work in the old office of Mies von Der Rohe. Through the successor firms, I worked at Lohan Associates until 1989. I collaborated with Dirk Lohan, Mies's grandson, on many projects, ultimately sitting in an office with Mies's original dining room table as my desk. That was really a wow. Every morning I'd come and I'd feel that beautiful oak surface. I started in Tunovich Associates in 1990. Our firm worked heavily in historic preservation. In 1996, I became involved with LPCI, Landmarks Preservation Council of Illinois, that changed its name to Landmarks Illinois in July of 2006. I will refer to this wonderful organization as Landmarks Illinois during my talk. I was elected board chairman from 2002 to 2004. I thought during some calm years, little did I know what was going to happen. I participated heavily with my firm in the Edith Fonsworth House auction, purchase, restoration, and reopening of this masterpiece. I'm honored to share my story with you today. This photograph, like the photographs that uh, Bonnie shared, uh, illustrates the incredible nature of this masterpiece. Uh, Mies van der Rohe, in all his glory here, designing a building as if he would design it for himself, something that Ms. Fonsworth had wished him to do. So the story starts with Mies coming to Chicago as a, as a young man in 1938. He had established his reputation as being one of the great, great modern designers of the 20th century before coming uh, to Chicago. His work with the Barcelona Pavilion, Tugendhat House, and many other projects that he completed in Europe had gained international notoriety. Mies escaped the turmoil in Germany and settled in Chicago in 1937. He became dean of the School of the Art. He, he became dean of the Architecture School at the Illinois Institute of Technology and also uh, started his own firm here in Chicago in 1938. Me um, spent the rest of his life here in Chicago, but designed buildings around the world and became a major, major influence in modern architecture in the 20th century. Dr. Edith Fonsworth was a, was a prominent Nephro nephrologist, nephrologist, um, and for those that don't know, a, a kidney specialist of national repute, um, a wonderful woman who was very prominent in the social circles of, Chica of Chicago. She met with Mies at a dinner party in 1946. They became friends. Edith wanted Mies to design a vacation home for her, a vacation home in nature. She loved nature. She was always photographed with her dear poodle, Amy. Almost every photo you see of Dr. Fonsworth was with Amy. She loved nature. She loved plants. She loved the way nature could come within her house. That is what she wanted and Mies agreed. Together they moved forth. They selected a site on the Fox River, south of Chicago, 
seven and a seven point one acres uh, identified here uh, in the corner, right down here. Seven point one acres along the Fox River. Uh, this slide, this aerial slide, shows the new bridge that was constructed. That's progress for you. There's a beautiful old bridge that was there originally. But this very rural site, um, very pastoral, very much uh, covered in woods. And here you can see these are these are later pictures, obviously, then with the house in place. But the original site being the 7.1 acres alongside the bridge that went across the, the Fox River, the original bridge, uh, which was replaced. This is progress for you. We substituted that beautiful old bridge for a concrete abutment. Um, the drive to the Fonsworth house is actually magical. Driving to Plano, Illinois, you go through a, a hilly, a hilly version of Illinois with these oak trees that are visible. It's just a marvelous drive that everybody should take. This is an original picture of the of the site from 1946. Uh, there's a clearing on the site, but it was a heavily wooded site. Um, both Meese and Edith Fonsworth had a desire to allow nature to come within the house, large windows, to actually experience nature from every part of the house. This is something that they were, that was a common element, a common design element that they wanted to incorporate within the house. Um, I'll get into some of this overall site later, but um, the 7.1 acres is showing over here to the left, the red dotted line. That was the original site. Um, ultimately, when Lord Palumbo uh, took occupancy, he expanded the property to 58 acres that went all the way to the end uh, of the red lines on the right of the, the right side of the photograph. Here you can see the old bridge dotted in here that was removed. Uh, and you can see the location of the site on the Fox River where it stands today. That's wrong. So in 1946, uh, Mises' office, in collaboration with Dr. Fonsworth, started the design of the house. The design was essentially done in 1946. It sat, it sat, this was a model that was built in the office at that time. This model sat in the back of the office for a number of years, um, but you can see the house was 55 feet wide, the living space by 28 feet wide. It had an expansive lower deck and a screen porch. There were a few things that Mies and Dr. Fonsworth disagreed upon. Mies did not like the screen porch. Edith said, how can you build a vacation home in the woods along the Fox River without a screen porch in Illinois in the middle of summer? And so he acquiesced and designed it with a screen porch. And uh, here you see that included uh, in the model. The house was set five feet above the, the surrounding land to allow for flooding to occur. Um, we never, and Mies never anticipated the extent of flooding, future flooding that would come with development along the river. The original plan is shown here with the house set between the trees with views, view sheds going out towards the, the Fox River. And there you can see in the upper upper right, the actual enclosure of the porch with the uh, mosquito screens in place and the lower, the lower, the, the, the lower deck uh, in front of the house. Um, here is, here is Mies at the, um, 
1947 exhibit within the Museum of Modern Art, where the, the house was put on display, along with many, many other beautiful photographs and renderings and sketches. Um, Mrs. Mrs. Fonsworth gave Miss Fonsworth gave Mies the direction. Mies, build it as if you were building your own house. And he took it to heart, and this is what he did. And the end result is this is this masterpiece. Next slide. Mrs. Fonsworth was very actively involved in every aspect of the design, obviously, as was Mies. Uh, here's a picture uh, of Myron Goldsmith. Myron Goldsmith was an architect within Mises' office and went on to do wonderful, incredible work with Skidmore Owens and Merrill all over the world. Um, he was the structural engineer of record. He was essentially the project architect within Mises' office, involved with all the details. And also, he was the construction manager. Um, Mises' office were the engineers, structural engineers, the architects, and the construction managers. The only outside consultants they used really was the mechanical and electrical engineers for the, the, the furnace and the electrical systems. Excellent. The house was designed, and in 1950, construction began. Um, even though the house was designed in 46, uh, it didn't start until almost four years later. In, uh, in 49, the drawings were completed. And then in 50, construction started. Uh, Mies was very present on the site. Um, according to Myron Goldsmith, um, he was there aching and absolutely uh, uh, living every detail of the house. Uh, every, nothing escaped his incredible eyes. Every little detail of the house came under his scrutiny, not only within the office, but out in the field. Next slide. Edith was also very prominent prominent in uh, on site uh, with Amy, and she too took great interest in the construction, every little detail as it went forth. Here you see Mies on site, overseeing the installation of uh, Roman travertine on the steps of the Fonsworth house and the house under construction. With the workers, according to Myron Goldsmith, the workers just loved working on this house. They understood almost intrinsically that they were doing something very, very special. And indeed they were. Just other pictures of the, the, the house under construction, the furnace, and the elements that went into the central core of the house. The house was really one, one room separated with these two core elements that carried all of the utilities. And here you can see the construction of some of those utilities on the inside of that core. Next slide. Here you see the enclosure, the original enclosure of the uh, upper deck and the mosquito screen that was that was put in place um, and could actually be removed. Um, and you'll see some photos from the Edith years where that was in fact there and it was removed in other times. You can also see that some early pictures uh, from the from the building that shows that the high water was prevalent from the Fox River even in those early days. And it only got worse as time went by and development in, 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 in development increased. Next slide. Edith took possession of the house in 1951 uh, after the collaboration with Mies and his office halted in 1951. Um, they became estranged and, um, and Mies and his office and all who had worked on that uh, all the other architects in his office uh, were not permitted on the site for over 20 years. 
Um, so that was the beginning, really, of the time that Edith occupied the house 20 years from 1951 until 1971, uh, 20 years where she furnished the house. Uh, initially, Meissner talked about designing, perhaps designing the furniture of the house together and working on um, some new furniture ideas for how the house could be furnished. Um, those were those were never implemented uh, during their breakdown and collaboration. And uh, I won't get into all of the um, stories that, that have been written about uh, what led to the breakup between Mies and Edith. Um, however, um, these are the facts of how Edith continued on with the occupancy of the house. These photographs show uh, how Edith lived in the house, um, loved the idea of nature coming into the house through this glass element that, that really entered into the forest. Next slide. Here you can see the enclosed porch, the furniture that she had selected and lived with for the 20 years that she lived within the house. And a collection of images of her and her friends. And really, this is her work desk uh, that she worked at on this typewriter. And you can see really what the house, what how what the house meant to her, this inside outside feel. Um, you were really part of nature in this in this incredible structure. And then in 1971. Um, if you drove down Fox River Road, you'd see this for sale sign. This is the original for sale sign. Um, and the house was for sale. That would be 1971. And then along came Lord Palumbo. Lord Palumbo had worked with me during the 1960s on putting together a scheme to build an office building in London. He knew he knew, knew Meese very well. He knew Meese's grandson, Dirk, very well. And uh, he became aware that the house was for sale. Uh, Peter was the son of a developer, his father, a real estate developer, and um, he continued in his father's steps as a developer wishing to build uh, one of the one of the most talked about projects in London in many years. Next slide. Manson House Square project was worked with Mises office and went through the entire uh, hearing process within London before it was turned down. That's the uh, slide on the top right. But Peter was also a philanthropist and a collector of uh, wonderful art. He owned two other houses um, in Pennsylvania, uh, Kentucky Knob. And he. this is a picture of the building he owned uh, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And at the same time, he also owned a home by Le, Cor Le Corbusier uh, in Paris, uh, the Manchons Chaoul. And um, these buildings he owned for uh, several years. At one time, owned these homes uh, along with the Fonsworth House. Next slide. Peter purchased the Fonsworth House in 1972. The house was in poor condition, um, very poor condition. And so in collaboration with uh, collaboration with Mises office, he restored the house and brought it back to uh, the design that Mies had intended uh, initially. Um, here you can see some of the early pictures right after uh, the renovation or the restoration that 
uh, Peter had put in place um, right after taking possession in 71. He painstakingly restored all aspects of the house, both inside and outside, and then undertook a program of improving the, the grounds, bringing art, bringing sculpture to the grounds of the Fonsworth house. You see the images from the early 70s. And he also entertained, loved to entertain out there when he was there. And so this is how he set the table within the Fonsworth house. And uh, he enjoyed, he loved the Fonsworth house. He loved the transparency. He loved the way that nature was allowed to come within the house. And he loved everything about the house. And, and he was a steward that we all should be we all should be very grateful for, for the number of years that he, almost 30 years, 31 years that he was the patron of this marvelous building. I mentioned that he actually brought art and sculpture to the grounds of the Fonsworth House and ultimately purchased additional land so that the entire project had 58 acres uh, on the site. However, in 1996, uh, nature bit back at him, and one of the highest recorded floods of the Fox River occurred um, in that summer. Here are some of the photographs of the damage. Uh, the house was totally, totally devastated on the inside. You can see the height of the floodwaters actually on the, on the surrounding curtains. Uh, it's almost four and a half to five feet above the floor of the, of the house. So that means it was 10 feet above the ground um, surrounding the house. Um, Mises office, should I say, uh, yes, Mises, Mises office painstakingly restored the house with Lord Palumbo. Uh, Lord Palumbo, spared no expense in bringing the house back to an immaculate level of quality. And these slides illustrate the work after he had completed that restoration. Um, these slides accurately show how Mies intended the building to be built. These beautiful details these very slender elements that are both structure and enclosing elements of the house. This indeed is a, Lord Palumbo talked about this as one of his sculptures, uh, a sculpture in the woods, in the garden. He loved this place and he put his heart and soul into it and it's visible through, through these photographs. Um, he then, he did expand the overall uh, site, as I mentioned, to be 58 acres, extending all the way down River Road. And then in uh, 2001, Peter, in, a, in, an, in an interview with the <clears throat> London Financial Times, he said that recent burglaries, as well as his own serious health problems, had led him to decide to sell the house, to sell the Fonsworth house. So after almost 30 years, um, he was ready to move on. In April of 2001, after Palumbo's intentions became known, Friends of the Fonsworth House formed with the strategy of preserving the landmark by arranging for the state to buy it. Um, among the friends of the, among the friends of the in Chicago were architects Helmut Jan, John Vinci, and Mises' grandson Dirk Lohan, as well as John Bryan, former chairman of the Sarah Lee Former Corporation, and former governor James Thompson. They approached the state of Illinois to fund and purchase the house. After the summer of 2002, the house was closed at the very popular weekend tours, weekend tours that had as many as 5,000 people 
uh, a year accommodated to view the home. After prolonged negotiations, a deal was hammered out with Governor George Ryan, and the only remaining formality was approval by Illinois Attorney General. The formality morphed into a death blow, and in February of 2003, Attorney General Lisa Mag Madigan vetoed the deal that was to cover the $7 million sale price of the house. In, 2000, in, in April of 2003, Palumbo announced that the Fonsworth House would be auctioned and sold at Sotheby's in New York on December the 12th, 2003. Unfortunately, the friends of the Fonsworth House had no backup plan. They thought that the deal with the state was done. In April of 2003, John Bryan called David Bauman with an emergency cry for help. In response to that call for help, remember that call, David then called me. He said, what are we gonna do? I said, you know, why don't we work out a scheme where we can purchase the Edith Fonsworth house? David didn't pause a second. He said, I'm in, let's go. At an emergency board meeting in April of 2003, as David said, as preservationists, we could not have come forth and make something extraordinary happen to protect this international resource, then why are we in the preservation business? Landmark Illinois board unanimously approved $1 million for the purchase. Landmarks Illinois approached the National Trust to match their pledge. They agreed. John Bryan and the Friends of the Fonsworth House raised an additional $1.5 million. Pledges came in from many others in response to the grassroots, grassroots fundraising operation. December 15th, December 13th, finally arrived. Several Landmarks Illinois board members and friends of the Fonsworth House attended the auction at Sotheby's in New York. At an early morning briefing, John Bryan informed us that as much as 6.5 would be needed to win in addition to the Sotheby's Commission. That was altogether almost $7.5 million. We collectively went to New York with about 3.5 million. So we called another emergency meeting. The Landmarks Illinois Executive Board conferred a meeting at the Metropolitan Museum of Art I can remember we went over and they had this beautiful salad. Oh, it was a lovely salad. Nobody touched the food. It was, uh, we had enough members uh, of the executive board for a quorum. So there we committed to contributing another million dollars subordinated by the excess land and subject to a match from the, the National Trust. What an incredible move. After our executive committee meeting, the National Trust agreed to match our additional $1 million pledge. So immediately we came up with $2 million in, in, in additional contributions. If successful, Landmarks Illinois would operate the house. The National Trust would take ownership. John, John Bryan and other members of the Friends of the Fonders, Fonsworth House increased their contributions. At 2 p.m., the auction started. Here you can see the slide with the model out in front. They built an awful model, but it, <laughs> it, 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 it was Sotheby's. Um, at 2 o'clock, the auction started. Richard Gray, one of Chicago's leading gallery owners, ran the auction for the Landmarks Illinois, for Landmarks Illinois, the National Trust, and the Friends of the Fonsworth House. The bidding quickly moved to 6 million. Richard had a limit of 6.5 million for the hammer price. Of course, you had to add the other 800,000 for Sotheby's commission. Our final 6.5 million was surpassed by the opposition, $6.6 .6 million bid. 
we think that that particular bid was an international bid where the house would have been picked up, dismantled, and moved to another country and put up for display. Richard Gray, Gray kept bidding. He offered the winning bid of $6.7 million. Mr. Ryan whispered to Mr. Gray, Richard, I hope you know that you're on your own. The additional money came from Richard. The auction for the Edith Hounsworth, the auction for the Edith Fonsworth House was won. These were the members of the Landmarks Illinois board who were there, along with John Bryan. Um, really a great, great day in the preservation of historic buildings in America. And it got great publicity around the world. Um, these were headlines that, that shone bright everywhere. And then, of course, the work was to begin. We took occupancy of the building in December of 2023. I offered our office to help to bring the, uh, bring the building back so that it could be brought back into the public domain. And we worked very carefully with the National Trust and the National Park Service on uh, all of the improvements that needed to be made, some of the repairs that had to be made that started in December of 2000 and 2003. Um, much of the travertine, the travertine steps, the lower two steps were replaced. Where could you find Roman travertine, the exact Roman travertine for replacement of the Farnsworth House steps? But at the same time, Mises 860 and 880 North Lakeshore Drive uh, were having renovations of their own done, and the same travertine had been used over at 860 and 880. Using that source, they had a source of stone over there. We used that stone to replace the lower two steps of the lower, the lower deck and also replace several pieces of the travertine that had deteriorated over the years. We also refinished all of the materials on the inside that had um, shown wear and tear. And you can see here the Roman travertine, the teak on the, the wardrobe that had been built, the primavera for the core, and the how they went together with the hardware within the space. We also arranged for the, the landscape to be improved and uh, brought up uh, beautifully. And some of these images show the work that we had done on the, on the uh, grounds and also uh, repainting the house both inside and out. Rebuilding some of the bridges and actually uh, working the landscape in with the paths that were necessary for uh, public tours. And these are some of the images that, that were the result of that work. We also rebuilt the visitor center. Uh, the visitor center on the bottom right is what we inherited December of 2023. Here you can see the improvements under construction. And then the finished visitor center here that takes a little bit from the farm buildings um, in the surrounding community, but it also has all of the um, paraphernalia um, for sale uh, within the house. Here is the great day that I'm so proud of, March 15th, 2004, when we reopened, when we reopened the Fonsworth House uh, to the public. And this was this great scene with all of the people who came out. I think there was over 500 people showed up. Uh, for this for this occasion, and this indeed returned the Fonsworth House to the public domain. Uh, here's a picture of uh, David and uh, Dick Moe, director of the National Trust, Dirk Lohan, and myself on the left. Uh, and really a letter that we included here from some high schools, a, a high school teacher who taught German at a local high school. 
and about how he wanted to send along to us contributions from his students in his class while he said they paled in comparison to some of the other donations. He wanted us to know what a wonderful, wonderful thing we had been doing here. And so the, the Fonsworth house was saved and images like this can be seen by people that come from all over the world looking through this incredible structure out into this beautiful Illinois landscape. And the Farnsworth House is used for many purposes now. A play that was held there uh, about Mies and Edith's relationship, about, in this picture here, I did want to note that the photograph with myself and with Al Navicka Sell, who worked tirelessly on the restoration along with our office. Um, much of many of the photographs you see here and the work that Al was able to achieve in a very short period of time allowed us to open the house in May of 2004. And David after we took occupancy of the house, then being the steward of a landmark, discovered how difficult that was through the, the floods that we had to endure, through uh, the funding difficulties that occurred later um, with operating a house like this. Um, ultimately, uh, the National Trust act, have taken over the have taken over the actual operations of the house. We still have an easement on the property and are still heavily involved, but we were not in the rowboat like David was here, um, moving furniture and lifting up the curtains to prevent damage as in previous years. The house is returned to the public. Here you see young architects getting ready to tour the house. And this is one of my favorite pictures here on the, on the left that shows how young people just love this place and uh, that the house is now back open for, for public consumption. So I'm very honored to have been able to show and talk a little today about my experiences here at the Fonzer House. Joe, I'm sure I echo everyone who is watching that that, that was absolutely incredible. Those photos, um, so you know, show the dynamism of this story, and you illustrate it beautifully, as you, as you always do with your storytelling. So we are so thankful that you spent this time with us today to help with this kickoff of the 20th anniversary celebration. So for those who are watching, we have a few minutes with Joe still to answer your questions. Um, he gave such a thorough presentation, uh, but I'm sure there are more questions about where we stand today with the, the plans for the home in the future. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat. And I, I'm happy to kick it off, Joe, because having heard you tell these stories, you know, you, the, the heart and the passion of this comes into play. Um, so I'm just interested to, to hear, you know, where do you feel that this preservation effort uh, stands in the work of preservation in Chicago or beyond? How would you position this? Well, I think uh, one of your statements uh, at the beginning where you said that this was now one of the, the second most revered examples of modern architecture in the world. Mm -hmm. So we as a preservation organization working in Chicago had this challenge where somebody could have come in here bought the house, picked it up and moved it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And we call ourselves preservationists. I don't think we could <laughs> live with ourselves. But I think like Chicagoans, we always do. We find a way. And I think there's many, many people that have worked so hard to make this come about. And I think it's the perfect example of how preservation can really make an effect. And but you've got to step forward. You've got to have people willing to step forward, willing to spend the time, willing to raise the money, willing to 
push Absolutely. the elbows. But I do think also that um, all, all of the work that was done with the state should not have gone for naught. Um, I, I do believe that this is a state resource and just from a, just, just from a visitors, you count the number of visitors that come, come to this. This is a, this is a piece of, this is a jewel within our state. So. Absolutely. Thousands of people visit from all around the world. And I mean, thank you to the, to you to the to the board and the the team at Landmarks Illinois, um, I really just want to say I think this set the stage for what uh, is possible by in preservation um, when there's the courage and the will to do things like this. And it really set the stage for some of you may be aware of our work on Prentice Women's Hospital and the work on the James R. Thompson Center. Um, I, I would. This, um, this was a landmark in making preservation happen, Joe. Uh, we have some questions coming in. So I know some of you raised your hand and we don't have the video enabled for you to ask your question. So thank you for putting them into the chat. Um, so Joe, we have a, let me start here with, uh, we have some coming in. Uh, Pat Lewis asks, what was the original cost of the house? Do you know? Well, there's a big debate on that. Uh... It's between seventy-five thousand and eighty-five thousand dollars, and that was a big debate that that actually took up a whole lawsuit. So I'm not going to comment on really <laughs> what should the cost be. Mm -hmm. However, uh, uh, and then there was the question of fees, which were so minuscule. Um, especially when you see what the architect did here. He not only was the architect, but the structural engineer and the general contractor. Right. So, uh, uh, but the, 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 the cost of the house was somewhere between 75 and $85,000. Mm -hmm. I, I think you have an opinion, it sounds like, on the architect's fees, uh, Joe. <laughs> so... <laughs> We uh we have other good questions coming in. So did, so did <laughs> so did Edith. And yes, I'm that sure. That was one of the. I I I mean it it was um, given the amount of work that was done by the firm, um, the office of Ms. Um It was his. It was the only time that I believe that the, they had ever done that in the history of the firm, where they had done everything like that. I think mm -hmm. perhaps it came a little from Mises' days of working in Germany, where that was, you know, done more often than uh, than here in the United States. In the United States. Well, it, we uh, have a question from our our prior uh, director of policy advocacy, Jim Peters, and he is asking about the status of the discussions of what to do with the house based on the flooding. Uh, Joe, do you want to reference that? Do you do you want me to talk about what we what we know here at Landmarks? Well, yeah, you know, again, there's many opinions, and and I know that there are schemes that hydraulic schemes that would be put in where you could raise and lower the house. And I looked at the prices of some of that and it's extraordinary. It's, um, um, and those are, those are being investigated right now. Um, it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a lot of money. And, and I, th I think that the, the better thing to do is work on keeping the water low uh, yeah, myself, I mean, being more restrictive on developments and being very restrictive on being, you know, trying to lower the level of, 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 of to, trying to lower the level of the river so that we cannot have these constant incursions of flooding. That's flooding comes from the water, just, just not being able to be stored elsewhere. I think we should take that approach rather than spending $40 million on pumps. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, maybe a quick question here. Do you know what the interior height of the house is? Uh, the interior height of the house, I believe, is approximately 12 feet. Um, I, I don't have that right at the tip of my tongue, but you sure, can see sure. from... Uh, interesting, though, um, when, when you talk about the height and you see, I think you could see in some of the pictures where you do have people around it, 
there was one value engineering element that went into, uh, yeah, they actually saved money. Um, they, was, they were afraid of where the money was going. And one suggestion was to reduce the house in total by 10%, just shrink everything. Hmm. And Edith, Edith was a gosh. She, she went to me and said, oh, how, could, how could we consider that? Would it be all right? And me thought about it. And he agreed to that because mm -hmm. all of the proportions stayed the same, but the whole house was reduced by 10%. And they utilized that savings in money to help get the building built. Absolutely. Uh, that is a that is a great tidbit for people. Uh, some of the backstory that um, we have a couple other questions that just, just uh, if I may say, it, it, yeah, it sure. also goes it goes back to you know the the scale of the house, the height of the ceiling was originally built so genu generously that you could do that. So, mm -hmm. but so Mies we felt have these felt that, that was okay. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And uh, we had a question about the event that's coming up for the 20th anniversary, just to let everyone know that earlier in the chat, we have a link to the uh, buying the tickets for the 20th anniversary on June 11th at IIT. That is the celebration coming up. Um, somebody asked the first highly regarded structure by New York Times, and we included the link to that. So I would encourage you to go back and take a look at that 2021 New York Times article uh, so you can see the 25 top post-war structures. Joe, we maybe have time for one or two more questions. So let me ask from Audrey Henderson, uh, a reporter who works with us very frequently. Uh, there's presently an operation to replace a number of the windows at the Farnsworth House. Please discuss the process of selecting the windows in order to adhere to the requirements of its historic status. And I can say actually all of the historic windows will have been replaced by the end of the, the current uh, restoration work that's happening. Um, so uh, with that, Joe, do you wanna comment on that? No, the I, I know that the uh, the restoration team that's working on um, those details are excellent. They're not going to do anything that compromises the historic significance of the house. They're agonizing over every little millimeter of mm -hmm. stop to accommodate the glass that's required. Um, and so I have great faith that they will come to the right decision. Um, mm -hmm. and it's painstaking. We made a lot of decisions in just the eh, six months that we worked intensively with the National Trust. You know, we had to select a white paint. We painted the house. I mean, usually it takes three years to get approval from the National Park Service, you know, to get on a national monument building. So, but because everyone wanted to get it done, mm -hmm. we got almost instant approval. So we 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 we, we worked very very quickly. Um, but every little detail is being looked at so carefully. I am convinced that the uh, right solution will come come mm -hmm. about. So, so Thank don't you. fear. Thank you, Joe. And we had a number of uh, questions in here about opinions about the flooding and to let uh, the public know that there were three options considered. Uh, you know, one was potentially moving the house. One was uh, building up a berm or a bank to raise it up. And then another was a mechanical solution that would use hydraulics to lift the building up and down. And the, uh, the National Trust is still exploring uh, the third option. Um, so I think a comment and then one last question, Joe. So one comment from Lisa D. Kiera, um, our you know uh, uh, immediate past director of advocacy to say, this would not have happened without you, Joe. We all thank you for your leadership. Um, the board had to make this decision and, and you have led them to make some very courageous choices. So thank you for your many, many volunteer hours on this and so many others. Um, and this is a softball, but I think um, it's a great ending point. So is it better to visit the Farnsworth in the summer or the fall? The summer or the fall? No, I, I would encourage you to, to visit in all four seasons. Mm -hmm. I've been to Falling Water as a young man in all four seasons. And these houses look completely different. Hey, <laughs> season. Uh, so don't just go once, 
go four times and take your children. Joe, so thank you very much. And everyone, we just have a few more closing remarks. You can put into the chat the appreciation for Joe so he can see all of the, you know, all of the good feelings about this presentation today. Um, the, you know, the 20th anniversary celebration, as we mentioned, is coming up at IIT. It is being hosted by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, in partnership, we are co-sponsoring that at Landmarks Illinois, June 11th in the evening, starting at 4.30 um, at IIT. So the uh, chat had the link to buy tickets. You can, by the way, get discounted tickets of $100 up through May 28th. So buy those tickets now, everyone. You can also schedule a tour. As Joe just said, schedule four, uh, one each season to go and see the Edith Farnsworth House. You can go to the National Trust website. Uh, it's Edith. Uh, farnsworthhouse.org to arrange for your tour. And it is remarkable. It is unforgettable to go and see this site. Um, if you'd like to read more about the preservation effort, there is a new book coming out by uh, IIT professor Michelangelo Sabatino about the, the preservation, about the home itself. It is forthcoming in June. We have a link to the Fade On Press link uh, for the pre-order for that. Or you can come to the June 11th event and get a signed copy. So that would be wonderful. Uh, I would like to say thank you to our team for making these uh, these wonderful lectures possible. In addition to Joe and other volunteers, it takes work to put them together. That's Layla Wills. Thank you, our programs manager. And I want to give a big thank you to Suzanne German as well, who is our director of reinvestment, who has maintained this easement and all these conversations about the Farnsworth House since 2004. Uh, she just passed her 20th anniversary with us on April 1st. So congratulations, Suzanne, and thank you for all that you do with our easements program. Um, please uh, save your save the date for our next um, Snapshots lecture, which as you see here is going to be about the effort to save the uh, Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ here in Chicago as part of the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley National Monument, uh, which is here in Chicago and also, um, you know, in uh, um, Alabama or Mississippi as well, excuse me. Uh, so Tiffany Tolbert from the National Trust is going to be here to talk about that effort um, and registration is going to open up soon for that um, uh, presentation. We also want you to mark your calendars for our most endangered historic places. Uh, Joe has worked on many, many of these, so he's familiar with uh, how we work on our most endangered to do adaptive reuse studies and find successful solutions. So come and hear about that on May 7th at noon. That is a virtual uh, press conference as well. You are all welcome. Visit our website at landmarks.org to sign up. Um, and we also have our Driehaus Awards coming. So one side endangered, one side celebration. The Driehaus Awards, uh, as you see here, are going to be um, this fall and we're organizing the date, but we hope that you will join us. Um, we are accepting submissions right now for Driehaus Awards. You can find that at landmarks.org. And this is all made possible by a very generous donation, a grant from the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation um, named in honor of Mr. Driehaus who worked with us on several of our preservation success stories. So we encourage you to nominate a project, everyone. And as we mentioned at the front, uh, we hope you're excited by all of the work we've talked about today. You can support that by becoming a member of Landmarks. Uh, it starts at $35 a month. It's a critical way to ensure that we're able to help people save the places that matter to them and uh, to join our community, which is continuing to grow. Um, we also once again thank our sponsors of the Snapshots Lectures, our annual corporate sponsors, uh, of which Antunovich is one. So thank you, Joe. Um, and if you would like to join their ranks and the vital way that they support us, please get in contact with me. And with that, we thank you all for being here today. And if you have additional questions, please send them to us and we'll make sure that they, uh, they get to Joe uh, and we can answer them as best possible. But otherwise, we'll see you at the next Snapshots Lecture and have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.